In the heart of the Alaskan wilderness, a father and son set out on the trip of a lifetime. Then, disaster strikes. Watch out, Flint! Hold on! Swept under an ice shelf, they fight for their lives in freezing water. Dad, you gotta swim! They've lost everything and are at the mercy of prowling predators. The son faces a terrible dilemma. Stay with his father and wait for a rescue that may never come, or leave him and risk hiking out through 60 miles of dangerous terrain for help. A specially chartered plane has dropped Blake Stanfield and his father Neil in a remote Alaskan wilderness 60 miles from the nearest settlement. How's the raft coming? We're almost there. Get the coffee on. Neil runs a building management firm and Blake is a doctor. They've taken leave to spend some time together. My father and I started backpacking when I was a young boy. I always ended up loving that. He, he taught me to appreciate the outdoors. Isn't it beautiful, Dad? Well, a long way from Oklahoma City. Blake and I are good friends. We uh, talk every day and share our experiences. He's always been uh, a good kid. Blake's organized the rafting trip as a gift to his dad to celebrate a very special occasion. For my father's 65th birthday, I had planned this rafting trip uh, to the gates of the Arctic as a present to him. Although Neil's been looking forward to this, he knows it's going to be tough. Hey, Dad. Yeah? Can I over here? Sure. He'd really wanted Blake to book them on an organized group trip, but Blake had other ideas. Blake is uh, very independently minded and decided that, oh no, we don't want to do that. Uh, we want to be able to do whatever we want to do. Since he knew I would made up my mind, there wasn't much he was going to say that could make me change my mind. Okay, Dad. It would have been kind of nice to watch someone else do the hauling and shoving. Come on, Dad. You want to share this with... Ten strangers and a tour guide? Matter of fact, yeah. I had never wanted to, and still never want to go on a guided tour. Let's load her up. It was, you know, an experience that I wanted to have with my father, just the two of us. Better get going, Dad. Just checking everything ship shape. Where in the world did I put that lighter? I got it. Very calm. Very repellent. Almost anywhere in Alaska, you're going to run into many different types of wildlife, which includes bear, and of course, that's something that you always need to be prepared for. The gates of the Arctic National Park is spectacular but dangerous. It's home to hundreds of black bears and grizzlies, not to mention roaming packs of wolves. It's 13,000 square miles of near untouched wilderness. Father and son have no way of contacting the outside world. They've packed no radio or mobile phone. Blake's itinerary has them traveling south by raft down the Koyukuk River to the town of Bettles. It should take around six days. Let's go! It was about a 90-mile float that we had planned, just uh, camping and doing little short day hikes. We were just going to have fun. That's oh, beautiful, isn't it? Thanks, son. A wonderful, wonderful birthday present. 
most of our conversation was just how amazed we were with the beauty that we were surrounded by and how remote it was and how quiet it was. Blake and Neil have deliberately avoided the crowds by arriving in early June. It's two weeks before the start of the rafting season, so the men had the Koyukuk River all to themselves. Quite exciting, isn't it? I'm yeah. glad I came. <laughs> we commented on the way down the river that it wasn't it great to be the only ones on the river, the first ones on the river that year. And uh, there was a reason, as it turned out. They'd been rafting for just a couple of hours when they noticed that the river is changing. Flake, ice. Oh, yeah. Thought it would all be melted by now. Yeah, me too. For six months of the year, the rivers are choked with ice. During the summer, it all melts. But this early in the season, some patches have yet to thaw. The longer we floated, the more ice we actually started to encounter. It doesn't look like it's going to let up. Do you think we ought to stop this thing? The current's picking up speed, and Blake struggles to control the raft. I kept trying to look around the corner, hoping, hoping to find you know, wh which way we were going to be going. And that's when I realized that actually we didn't uh, have a choice where we were going. The men are at the mercy of the current. We're gonna have to pull in and stop this. I'm trying, Dad. I can't slow it down, though. We're going oh, too fast. Like, I can't slow it down, down Dad. Stay on. Stay on. It was sheer panic at the time, and it happened so quickly that there wasn't much time at all to think. The next thing I actually remember was being pulled right underneath the ice. There was so little time to, to realize what had happened, except that it was a real problem. It wasn't long before we came up in essentially an air chamber underneath the ice. The air pocket saves their lives, but the ice shelf could stretch on for miles. I remember looking over and my father yelling at him. Blake uh, yelled. Dad, I'm sorry. Of course, it wasn't his fault. Give my hand. Blake manages to grab Neil's hand. Hold on. But the current's too strong. Dad. His dad is swept away beneath the ice. The men are spat out from under the ice shelf, but their ordeal isn't over yet. We are being carried rapidly towards the second ice shelf. I saw it coming. I reached up and grabbed it to try to prevent from going under it. Of course, the river was such that I was carried underneath. The roof of this ice shelf is even lower than the last. And the second ice shelf had no room to breathe. I really thought I had taken my last breath. My father and I both ended up um, with a lot of abrasions to the top of our heads because we kept trying to come up to the air that we were hoping was there. I've never thought of a worse way of dying than drowning and, and was certainly thinking that uh, that is how I was going to die. After being under that water for what seemed like an eternity, I just remember popping out, taking in a nice big breath of air. At this time, I had no idea where my father was. He had been pushed up against something and trapped. Dad! Dad! 
I don't know how I would have been able to face my mother and the rest of my family, letting them know that my father had perished, you know, when, when I had made it. thing I remember seeing was his head above the water. The powerful current is sweeping Neil away. It didn't appear like he was making any attempt to get out of the river. And for all I knew, he was injured and couldn't. Neil's disorientated, but somehow he catches hold of a rock and hauls himself out. Blake knows that his dad has got to get to shore fast before he's paralyzed by cold and shock. And Blake, in the meantime, is yelling at me, and I can't hear him above the roar of the river. So eventually, I managed to get my breath long enough to tell him to shut up. Will you let me take for a minute? Blake was telling me that I had to swim over to him, which was the last thing in the world I wanted to do. Getting back in the river is dangerous. But Blake knows it's his dad's only chance. Come on, Dad. You can do it. You can do it, Dad. Yeah. I'm so sorry, Dad. It's okay. It's okay. It was just, just bad luck. Bad luck. As a doctor, Blake knows that his dad's in the first stages of hypothermia. I thought you were gone. The second I got him out, I realized he was shaking uncontrollably. It was mild seizure-like. Blake's desperate. All their spare clothes were lost in the accident. Then he remembers something. The lighter he stowed in his life jacket. It didn't get washed away, but it's soaking wet. When I pulled that lighter out of my pocket and hit the button, that torch lit up, and maybe we were going to be able to have a fire. I knew that we had to get a fire started. We had to get him out of those cold, wet clothes. We got we to get you dry. It's OK, Dad. You're going to be OK. Right. Neil's wet clothes are making his temperature right. fall even faster. Okay. Basically, while this fire got started, we, I hugged him and tried to give him some of the warmth that I had. Eventually got him to where he wasn't shaking anymore. Blake he had in his life vest a picture of his wife and son and uh, been so worried about ever seeing them again. And uh, we were both somewhat crying. It's OK, look, it's, it's going to be all right. I'll be back home. But Blake knows their prospects are bleak. They're stranded in a remote wilderness, and nobody expects them back for at least a week. Their raft is lost, along with all their food and gear. Worse still, 
The reserve is teeming with hundreds of wolves and bears. I think at that point we realized uh, that we got some big problems. Getting colder now, the sun's going down. You think we ought to find a more sheltered spot? Yeah. You okay to move? I guess I'll have to be. What are you doing? Show people where we're going. Figure there'll be no one to see it. Come on now. Blake and Neil set off to look for shelter. Blake lost his boots in the accident, but his pace still leaves his father lagging behind. I think that I wanted to move a lot faster than my father was able to move at the time. The freezing water has drained Neil's strength. He's 65 years old and still feeling the effects of an accident 12 months ago that left him with a broken ankle. Blake! Can we just hold up here a minute? You're not even trying to find a place to stop. Oh, sorry, Dad. I just got carried away. There's no way we're just walking out of here. We're going to have to find a good campsite and stay put. How agreed? All right. OK. Give me your hand. Here we were in the middle of this vast wilderness, a good 60 miles from the nearest human being. No one was expected to be flown into the area for at least two weeks after our trip. We were alone, and, and we were going to have to uh, endure or survive until either we found a way out of it or someone came looking for us. It's the rainy season, so the men set about building a shelter to protect them. It's crucial they stay warm and dry. But that's just the start of their problems. Hey, Blake! Come take a look at this! What? Tracks. What do you think? Black bear? Uh-uh. More like a grizzly to me. There's dozens of them around here. Oh, maybe they were just passing through. I'm gonna get that fire started. They packed a shotgun, but that's at the bottom of the river. Now, their only defense against prowling grizzlies is fire. Their ordeal has left Neil and Blake battered and bruised. Now they have to contend with the cold. We got enough wood? Yeah, we got lots. You get closer to the fire. I'm warm enough. There. My father and I took turns laying towards the front of the shelter where the fire was. Try and get some sleep, okay. Yeah. And then whoever was laying it back would bear hug the person in front. Sleeping won't be easy. It's summer and the sun barely dips below the horizon. But during the few hours of darkness, the temperature can still get close to freezing. I shivered myself to sleep. You know, we're going to sure our, my uh, clothes were still damp. But Blake can't sleep. He knows it'll be at least a week before anyone realizes they're missing. If they stay put, their chances of survival are slim. The only alternative is a grueling 60-mile hike to the nearest town. It was a long way to the nearest person. It was extremely rough terrain. 
We only had one set of shoes between the two of us. There were plenty of bears in the area. It was hard to take in the severity of the predicament that we were in. During the night, Blake has made a tough decision. Well, I needed to get back to battles. I needed to go find help. The number one rule of survival is stick together. But Blake knows his dad isn't up to the hike. Dad, you okay? Yeah. Very sore, though. You slept? Not too much, no. You know, I've been thinking. We gotta get ourselves organized. We gotta build up a, a nice big pile of firewood, maybe make some traps. We're gonna need some food. I'm going for help, Dad. Help? From where? Blake had uh, no doubt given it a lot of thought and decided that he could conquer this problem and, and uh, hike back to Bettles. Bettles is 60 miles away. This is just playing crazy. Look, we talked about this. First rule of survival, stick together. Dad, I know all that. But no one else is going to be coming down the river for weeks. We can't wait that long. Are you trying to get yourself killed? Have you even looked at the map? There's a darn great river in the way. I'd ask him how in the world he was going to get over the uh, Tingayuk uh, River to our south, which appeared to be a pretty good sized river. And he said, I don't know, I'll find a way. Yeah? How? This isn't some little stream. This is an Alaskan river in full flow. Now, do you have any idea how powerful that is? Yes, Dad. I was in one yesterday, remember? We're on our own, Dad. No one's coming. I'm telling you not to go. Leaving him alone was, was a hard decision, but I think he knew I was stubborn because I inherited that from him. You're really going, aren't you? Yes, sir, I am. I'm really going. Because if I don't, we're going to die here, Dad. Uh, you're going to need the knife. And the lighter. Now, what about the bears? You saw all those tracks. Well, you got the fire. That should keep them away. I meant you, son. What about the bears? I love you, Dad. Yeah. Me too. Well, you know I do. When I come back, Dad. Now, don't get yourself killed, you hear? I was emotional when he left. I felt alone and uh, very concerned about being alone, but uh, probably more worried about him and what he might encounter. Ahead of Blake is a 60-mile hike south to the nearest town. In such a vast expanse, he can't afford to get lost. One wrong turn could spell disaster. Now Blake's made a gut-wrenching decision to leave his dad alone and hike out for help. He's heading south for the town of Bethel, 60 miles away. The biggest obstacle in his path is the Tinyagook River. But first, he has to find it. Because of the scale of this map, it was a little bit difficult telling exactly where we were. I didn't have any great landmarks. The hiking is taking it out of Blake. The ground is rough and uneven, and he hasn't eaten for over 24 hours. but he's still making good progress. 
just a few hours after leaving his father, he hits the river. His dad warned him that crossing it would be impossible. It's freezing cold and fast running. He could even be dragged under another ice shelf. But Blake promised to get help, and the only way he can do that is to plunge in. As soon as I started to cross, the water was flowing fast enough that I realized I was just gonna have to jump and swim uh, over to the other side. Blake has proved his dad wrong. With the river behind him, it should be a straightforward hike to Bettles. Back at camp, 65-year-old Neil is hungry and tired. But he can't rest. Blake has their only lighter, so Neil's got to keep the fire alight. It's his only source of warmth and his sole defense against the bears. The difficulty of uh, keeping the fire going uh, was essentially being able to walk on, with only stocking foot waders on really uh, rocky soil. Neil hopes the fire will be enough to keep the bears and wolves at bay, but he also shouts to try to discourage an attack. Anybody home? Come on down and join me! <laughs> Despite his hardships, what really preys on his mind is what might be happening to his son. I was very worried about Blake what he might have run into. <laughs> like his dad, Blake is trying to frighten predators away by singing aloud. All night long, never got tired. Most of my songs were moose tunes and bear tunes, which was really quite ironic. I went and I walked in the woods one night. All alone, pale moonlight. I hid myself. Tree up. Let me see what I Suddenly, Blake comes face to face with a grizzly bear. A grizzly can tear your head off with one bite. But their claws can rip holes through you like uh, nobody's business, so you don't want to mess with them. The bear is some way off, but even the slightest sound could alert it to Blake's presence. I certainly sent the adrenaline through my body when I saw him. Blake daren't make a sound. The bear's too close. It was scary seeing him out there. He wasn't far enough away for my liking. The bear hasn't spotted him, but grizzlies have a sense of smell a hundred times more powerful than a human and can pick up the scent of prey from more than two miles away. But Blake's in luck. He's downwind of the bear, and his scent is carried in the opposite direction. But the wind could change. He risks making a run for it.
It's a lucky escape, but there's still a long way to go. Blake's making good ground. By his estimation, Bettles is just a day and a half's hike away. This is the Tinyagook River, the one Blake thought he'd crossed earlier that day. But that was just a minor tributary. His father was right, the Tinyagook is just too huge to cross. There's no way he can reach battles. I kind of lost a lot of that optimism that I had as soon as I saw that there was no way to cross this thing. Because it was so wide and so swiftly moving and so cold. It's a dead end. Blake defied his father and the basic rules of survival by hiking off by himself. Alone, both men are at far greater risk. I had a hard time deciding whether or not I should stay there because I knew I wasn't that far from my father. I certainly had some feelings of guilt that I had put him in this predicament. Now the mental and physical strain of the last two days finally catches up with him. I realized I needed to rest. That was, that was something my body was asking for at the time because it had been a long, long sludge. Blake hasn't eaten for 36 hours. The only thing I, that I really saw were some spiders, and there were a few that I swatted and, you know, and ate, just because I thought maybe they'll, I'll start to see more of these and have some nutrition. But the amount of nutrition I got from the few that I ate certainly didn't, didn't give me any energy, that's for sure. awakened by some raindrops that were hitting me on the face. I was worried about my father um, because, you know, he would have gotten just as wet. He didn't have a lighter to restart a fire had his gone out. In the rainy season, downpours can be intense. If the fire goes out, Neil risks bear attack and hypothermia. The possibility of rain uh, was a was a real problem. We would put out a fire, and there wasn't any way to keep the fire going. And uh, that's what I had to try to do. The rain clouds blow over. Now Neil faces his first night alone in a wilderness bristling with predators. As everyone knows, uh, you try to make noise in, in the wild with uh, where bears are present. You know, I said a lot of stupid things uh, in order to make noise, and uh, one of them was, I'm the king of this valley. Everyone who lives here lives here at my pleasure. You want to see me? You have to go through my nights. Blake. Where are you? I hope you're all right, Blake. I want to see you back here. His only defense against bears and wolves is his fire. And the difficulty of keeping the fire going was staying awake enough. I would wake up in the middle of the night and maybe have a problem and have to work to get her going again. If the fire goes out, Neil is in big trouble.
After a fitful night's sleep, Blake confronts the bleak reality of his situation. I was distraught when I realized that there was pretty much no way to, uh, to get to battles. I was a long way from what I'd hoped to be my final destination. But he has one slim hope. I kept thinking about the fact that these bush pilots fly up and down these rivers. So they might be flying directly overhead. If he can make himself more visible, he might be spotted by one of these passing planes. Despite his weakened state, he starts to gather driftwood for a signal fire. I actually set one of these log jams on fire, hoping that someone might see the smoke. But even this simple plan fails. Every time I looked up, into the sky, the smoke wasn't very white and smoky like you always see in, in the TV shows. You know, it, it wasn't that noticeable. It's Neil's third night alone in his brushwood shelter. I guess a spark jumped from the fire. All of a sudden, there was a fire going on right above my head, and I'm talking like 18 inches above my head. So I had to get out of there fast. He can only watch, helpless as his precious shelter burns to the ground. I got out of there and watched as the fire just burst into an inferno. Neil knows he must save part of it to light a new fire. Without it, he'll be freezing cold and have no protection from prowling predators. During the night, meltwater has flooded the river. Blake realizes he could be in danger. When I realized that the river was rising that quickly, I moved up into the forest because I was worried that I was actually gonna end up on a small island out there be trapped by water on all sides. Upriver, Neil is exhausted and hungry. His precious shelter was destroyed in the fire, leaving him exposed to the risk of a freezing downpour. Now daybreak brings a new enemy, the blazing sun. The sun was coming down pretty hard, and uh, there was essentially no cover. He needs to build a new shelter. But it's becoming harder and harder to carry out even simple tasks. Ow. There's only so much punishment a 65-year-old body can take. After three days without food, Neil is weakening. Blake's decision to hike for help has backfired. Now his actions could cost his father's life. Now Blake is gambling that staying by a major river will increase his chances of being spotted by local pilots. But since nobody knows they're missing, his chances of being rescued are slim. I was definitely depressed about the situation that that we were in, especially because I had so much time to think about it. Blake endures another day and night helplessly waiting. His
his constant fear that his dad hasn't survived his ordeal. Blake's decision to hike out looks increasingly like a bad move. Around six or seven in the evening on Tuesday, I was laying uh, over by my fire when I heard the sound of an airplane. And my God, he was coming up on me quick, I could tell. And I ran as fast as I could. He spotted me. He spotted me. Three hours later, and there's still no sign of rescue. After a while, I started thinking, oh, did I just hallucinate? Did I just, did I imagine that plane? If help doesn't come soon, Blake knows they're as good as dead. They flew over me. They uh, they dropped a you know a bag of stuff. The bag contains supplies and a walkie-talkie. I turned that radio on. I kind of told them what had happened. There's only one thought on Blake's mind. Please hurry! You gotta go find my dad. He's 15 miles upstream. There'll be a fire going. Just see a fire. The pilot launches an aerial search for Neil. And hang on, where are you guys at? Okay, we're gonna head north. A plane reaches the right area within 10 minutes. Neil's camp should be easy to spot. But when the pilot reports back to Blake, the news is bad. Keep going till you find him. He, he, he can't leave. He's got to be at the camp. Maybe he didn't go far enough. He can't walk. He's got to be there. I was worried something would happen to my dad. Because there's no way he could miss it. You got to go and find my dad. And I fell to my knees. Blake ignored his father's advice and left him to fend for himself. Now he must face a terrible thought, that his dad hasn't made it. The aerial search continues. But in such a vast wilderness, Neil's camp is proving hard to locate. Three hours later, a rescue helicopter picks up Blake and rushes to the scene. Did you know I was here? I asked your son. Blake? They climbed in the helicopter. Dad! I'm so sorry, Dad. 
so sorry. And hell, all I could say was, was, uh, man, you look like hell. Well, you don't look that cute yourself. <laughs> I was very happy to see him. Very, very happy. Can we get the hell home now? Let's get out of here. And then we took <laughs> off together again. The men later learned that their initial camp was not on the flight path of any local aircraft. If Blake hadn't tried to hike out to Bettles, he and his father would almost certainly have died. After the accident, Blake moved his family back from Alaska to Oklahoma City to be closer to his mum and dad. He now runs a GP practice there, while Neil continues to run his building management firm. Blake and Neil still regularly go hiking together, but they've never gone rafting again.